Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. So, you know, one of the questions you ask a patient during an intake with them is, you know, tell me how many drinks you have in an average right. week. Tell me which recreational drugs you use. Um, and this is not a judgmental discussion, but it's, you really want to understand this. And look, a lot of times people say, yep, I use Coke once a month. I do this, I do that, I do this one or that. And so the, the thing I discussed with them, and this is what, sort of what I explained to Olivia once was, you know, there are certain drugs, alcohol being a drug as well, where they change your state. I love, I've heard this podcast yeah, you did. Yeah, I love yeah, yeah. this. But they don't change traits. And then there are others that change your state and if you use them correctly, they can change your traits. Yep. And so I said, and by the way, there are legal and illegal molecules in both of those camps. Mm -hmm. And that's worth noting and respecting. But really, the things in this camp, you have to really ask yourself, how often am I doing this and why am I doing this? And so, you know, I put cocaine very clearly in this camp, right? right? It clearly changes your state. And I've never done cocaine, but the people I talk to who love it tell me how great they feel when they do it. But... They can't make a compelling case for me that it makes them better when they're not on cocaine. Hundred um, percent. And the same is true for alcohol in reality. So, so one, you know, you have to be careful about the use of those things. And obviously, the things we're talking about, psilocybin and MDMA, at least have the potential, if done correctly, to make you a better version of you long after that medicine is gone. Yeah, I remember you. I listened to that podcast of yours, and I, that's exactly it. Like, I am a different person because of those experiences, and I'm, I'm better. And the only reason I know that is because I, I'm more, um, I'm less afraid. I'm more patient. I think I have less answers. I'm more open. I mean, all the things that you, you hope to get in therapy, but it's very hard to get your brain to change. And I feel like, tell me from a physician standpoint, it opens up a pathway that was like blocked, like it had a blockade and you, you it was always there. You just hadn't gone down it. And so when I took psilocybin it, it like moved that blockade and there, there was a road I never knew that was just ease and love and fearlessness and after I was done I started to walk down that road more often in my day-to-day -day life because for so long it wasn't even accessible to me and now it's a road that I choose quite often um, and same thing with MDMA for me I've done that very rarely but it it's shown me fun how to just be connected and, and not, again, not judging and just, um, and if mom and you're listening, I know you guys had no idea. I was so edgy, but it gave me, so now, even if I don't do it, I remember the feeling I can access that, that, that neural pathway and I can go, oh, Kelsey, you know what it feels like to be at a, a party and be calm and not worrying about getting home and worried about the Uber and, and just like be here. And I can almost get myself to that new road that I, always had, but it just always had a huge blockade in front of it. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think, I think those are two good examples of how those molecules work. And I mean, I think MDMA really has this ability to, you know, so create this empathy that is yes. very difficult for most people to access, um, on command, uh, yeah. or, or frankly, not under the influence of that medication. And that's, to me, if you if you can craft the intention around that, it's um, you know it can really do an amazing thing for a relationship as well yeah. with yourself, but also with somebody else, especially if there has been something that's gone really wrong. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's probably been there's been a ton of gifts of grief, and I talk about them all the time. But I think that that those experiences have been, and everyone hates me for it because once I get excited about something, I get really excited. So I came out of the I came just blazing hot on. Uh, plant journeys. And now I kind of understand that you have to be ready and have to want it and have to be ready to be open to it. But I am. And the other thing I, I, I do think that, um, at least in my limited experience, um, I think that the best of both worlds is when you combine that work with the traditional work of therapy. Completely. And I do think that if there's one thing about the, the new appreciation people have of psychedelics that I think is dangerous it's that people believe that the plant or the molecule by itself can do all the work. Like all I have to do is do psilocybin once a month or once a quarter and, and it's all good. And it's like, no, those are incredible lubricants to allow you to do very difficult things when you're long off 
the influence of those medications. So I, I also think like, again, it's impossible to say what fraction of your recovery has been predicated on that experience versus all that came before it and after right. it and around it. Um, so that's kind of the one thing that I, I tend to remind that's smart people of. Yeah. I've done a ton of work. I've done, I've read a bunch. And I, I think the other big thing that I do that has supported all of that is just, I have a, I'm militant about meditation, militant. And were you before? I had started on the path, but maybe 20 minutes a day here and there, maybe insight timer. Um, once Nate died, it became a must. And to this day, and I, I saw you guys just got the sauna bag, but I will sit in with dispensa. I think dispensa probably, dispensa's work has probably changed my life the most in terms of a daily practice. So changing a thought or watching a thought or um, knowing that my feelings are transient and that I can change a feeling through it, changing a thought or I can say change or I can say stop. And um, it doesn't mean they're not going to come, but I do have some agency in how I feel and what I feel, which I never believed before. Um, so I think if you, if you, like you said, if you do the, the psychedelics in conjunction with a very deep meditation and you know, a committed spiritual practice that gives you peace, whatever that might be, you, you have a great shot at coming out of pretty much everything. Yeah. It's, I, I've always found it sad, I guess. And I, I, I'm only saying something that I'm sure a billion other people have thought or said. <laughs> um, but it's remarkable that this isn't taught alongside English science, math, to kids coming up in school. Like you, you can play the thought experiment of what if from the moment kids entered kindergarten, we had an emotional health class as well that was part of the core curriculum where you learned to distance yourself from your thoughts. And right. like, and you know, we're gonna spend 30 minutes a day on this course throughout, you know, K to 12. Yeah. Um, how many different habits could we develop and yeah. how could we equip ourselves? Thank you.